I'm Bob Herbert. Welcome to OpEd.TV. Ed Koch was the most fascinating and most important mayor of New York since LaGuardia. What was it that made him so compelling? Why did so many New Yorkers embrace him and so many others dislike him? And what was he really like behind the scenes? Koch the man as opposed to Koch the mayor. We'll talk about all of this with my guest, Neil Barsky, whose documentary Koch is being shown on PBS as part of its POV series, and Diane Coffey, Managing Director at the Peter J. Solomon Company. She served as Koch's Chief of Staff and was one of his closest advisors and friends. Welcome, guys. Thanks so much for doing the show. I appreciate it. Thank you, Bob. So, uh, Neil, I can think of a million <laughs> answers to this question, but what drew you to do a documentary about Ed Koch? Sure. Uh, it is a funny interview because you could have just as easily have done the interview, uh, the documentary, <laughs> and I could have been interviewing you, um, since you actually had much more experience with the mayor than I did when I was a, I was a young reporter uh, at the Wall Street Journal, the Daily News, when he was mayor. I didn't cover him, and I was a less young reporter covering him for the Daily News. Right, and I followed your stuff, and um, uh, and I remember it. Um, no, I, as time evolved, it you know I'm a New Yorker, I'm a journalist, I went into finance, um, I wasn't covering Koch, but. As someone who really cares about the city and try to, always tries to understand the city and who raised a family in New York, it always struck me that most people, especially outside of New York, kind of think that Rudy Giuliani saved New York. <laughs> uh, and, and a lot of things happened under him that were very positive. But the more I followed the history of New York, the more I came to realize that the real source of the recovery, not the only person responsible, but the real seeds were planted under these 12 colorful horrible, wonderful years of his administration. And so I wanted to tell the story of New York, contemporary New York, through the arc of his 12 years in office, which was 1978 to 1989. But at the same time, as I learned about how to make a film, because this was my first, um, it was clear that Ed Koch, as you know, and as Diane knows very well, was just a compelling character. He was funny, he was bossy, he was egotistical, he was charming, he was a bully. So great movies are about great stories, that's New York, and about great characters, and that was Ed Koch. So he had it all. I mean, it, it was a genius idea. It's also uh, a terrific uh, film. Thank it's, you. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a wonderful documentary. Mm -hmm. Now, whether you liked him or not, Koch really did seem like the quintessential New Yorker. Um, it's hard to imagine him um, uh, living and working in any other city other than New York and to give you just a little sense of what I mean we're gonna go to a clip uh, right away from the film take a look I look out the window and it overlooks the Brooklyn Bridge I see thousands of people walking across the bridge And I say to uh, Bob, I'm going to go downstairs. I didn't say why. There are lots of reporters. Hi, everybody. And they follow me as I walk towards the Brooklyn Bridge. And then as I get onto the bridge, it was like a Dibbuk took over. And I started to yell, keep walking, keep walking over the bridge. We're not going to let these bastards bring us to our knees. Thank you. I really appreciate your coming to work. Like Wait, this is ridiculous. Open. I gotta go to work to Yonkers. Yes. Anybody for 28th Street? Where are you going? Across town? What is the single biggest factor for it being more smooth than 66? Well, there's a different mayor, firstly, isn't that so? We're not gonna take the crack of a couple of wackos. Diane, he, he he seemed, for much of his mayoralty, to be just the right person. The cliche is at the right time, but I, I think that really was true in Ed's case, especially in the early years. Talk a little bit about what New York was like, um, let's say, in the first few years after he became mayor. Well, I would say, uh, when I think when Ed became the mayor, the city was really dysfunctional. Uh, there was a lack of spirit. People were not happy to be here. They were worried about crime, terribly worried about crime. There was a certain lack of uh, zest and spirit and energy. And I think one of the things that Ed did so well was to restore a sense of energy and spirit and pride in the city of New York because, because of something like the subway strike, which you just 
showed on your uh, on the film uh, because he wasn't afraid of anybody. He wasn't afraid of making enemies, if you will, enemies in quotes, but he wasn't afraid of what people said or thought about him in, in the sense that he had just been elected, but he wanted people to feel better about living here and he wanted to make the city work. And he, I, we used to laugh about and I used to complain to him about criticizing his predecessors, which I didn't think was very smart. <laughs> but he would say, but Diane, he was a terrible mayor. <laughs> and I'm not going to say which person he meant. but I Probably said, more than one. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I don't think it's good policy ever to criticize your predecessors, whether you like them or don't like them. If you like them, you can praise them. But uh, this was something that we argued about on a regular basis because he wanted to stand out and he wanted people to feel good about him being the mayor. And so he tried to embrace the public. And I think he did it very well because he took on the unions right off the bat, which was at that time a very popular uh, The unions were popular. The, it was popular with the public. Oh, I'm sorry, to take, to on, take the on the unions. Because of the transit strike. Mm -hmm. that's, that's what I'm really right. talking about. Because he would not agree to pay the terms that they wanted. He felt that that would bankrupt the city and all he cared about was making people happy and, and having a balanced budget. That's what, so we could begin reliving the city you know, anew. You could get that sense of the spirit that he brought to the city in that clip during the subway strike. And New Yorkers, right. I agree with you, really needed that at the mm -hmm. time. The city was demoralized. So he made New Yorkers feel better on the one hand. But there was also, um, you were talking about the bankruptcy, there was also the substantive mm -hmm. uh, uh, parts of the Koch program mm -hmm. in the beginning, when, as, as you were mentioning, taking on the unions. Talk about some of the substance in, the, in that period of the fiscal crisis. Well, the substance was that the city had no choice but to balance its budget, which it hadn't done before. That was a mandated, state-mandated um, edict based on an agreement to bail it out the city in the 70s. He did that. He did that for 12 straight years, and that was unheard of. Um, and that was huge because that would lower the cost of borrowing in the bond market, and so that had a real uh, impact. And we have a great clip, a great scene in the film where he goes down to Washington to try to get loan guarantees, and he's got the senators eating at, uh, out of the palm of his hand <laughs> because of his humor, but also because of his bluntness and his, his candor. So he was a very good mayor at saying no. And, and during the period when you had to say no, he excelled. Because like Diane said, he didn't mind angering people, alienating people. He did what was right for the city. When things got better and he had to say yes and he had to make choices, and that was harder for him, connecting with certain parts of the city. And so I, I don't think his record's unblemished at all. I mean, I think he made mistakes. I, we can probably have time to get into those. But there's no question. Not a lot of time. <laughs> not enough? Not enough time. But no, but I mean, the reason I did the film is not because he made mistakes. The reason I made the film is because of his huge positive impact on New York. And so I don't want to obscure that. Um, and that had to do with morale. That had to do with um, the fiscal uh, stability. And then later in his administration, the $5.5 billion housing program, which completely rebuilt the neighborhoods, which was one thing I felt he didn't get enough credit for. So there's some very material, tangible things he did, not just spirit but also rebuilding New York, uh, which was critical. How much time did you spend with him when you were making the film? Well, we shot over the course of a year. You know how it goes. It's not every day by any stretch. We had about five sit-down interviews, which were several hours, and then we had the verite scenes where we'd follow him around, whether it was uh, election night uh, when Ma uh, Andrew Cuomo was elected, going into the neighborhoods, spending time with his family. So we spent a fair amount of time, I would say, I don't know if it's 100 hours of shooting, but it was, uh, it was significant. Did your take on Ed Koch change during the course of making the film? Did you have a different view of him when it was all over than you did at the beginning? Um, well, certainly I got to know him better, and I would say the Ed Koch, uh, the contemporary Ed Koch, seemed to be a nicer, more gracious person than the Ed Koch as mayor in the 1970s. He had an air of civility about him. He was very, um, very candid, but also very ethical in the way we dealt with each other. Um, and he was really quite pleasant and very easygoing. Um, I think I was a little intimidated at first. Probably was intimidated through the whole time. You know, he would be, he, I angered him a few times, and things <laughs> didn't always go straight, and that could be unsettling. Um, but he was exceedingly uh, professional, 
Um, he was a man of his word. And yet the Ed Koch I knew from when I was a New York, as a New Yorker and from the clips, I think, was a little less likable. I think he was a little more of a bully. I think he lowered the level of civil discourse a little in New York when he was mayor. And I didn't see that when I got to know him uh, shooting the film. And I, I again, and uh, Diane's a better judge, but I think he may have changed and may have mellowed over the years. Do you think he did? I do. Mm -hmm. um, I do. I think when he left office, it took a, it took a while. But if you, <laughs> if, you, if you look at those last years from the time he left office in 1990 to the day he died, which was in 2013, he had built up a, a wonderful residue of respect and admiration on the part of New Yorkers and non-New Yorkers. I mean, I traveled with him various places and wherever we would go, on the train in Washington, D.C., people would come up all colors, shapes, sizes. You're Mayor Koch, aren't you? <laughs> oh, I want to say hello. I want to shake your hand. And he loved that. Yeah. But, but because, and I think Neil, Neil expressed it well, he, he decided at some point he really didn't have to be angry at people anymore. And he was having a nice time in his afterlife, if you will. His, he always wanted to be relevant. He was terrified of not having a job mm -hmm. or not having a place to be, not having a platform to speak. I mean, he would call up reporters if he disagreed with something they wrote and tell them. Uh, trust me, I know that. <laughs> <laughs> to the end. I mean, even after he left office, he would do that. He was wildly popular in the mm -hmm. early years, and, let, and yet he had some colossal battles. And yeah. one of the first one was over the closing of Sydenham Hospital mm -hmm. right. uh, up in Harlem. Mm -hmm. um, what was that about? Just uh, talk about... Well, Sydenham Hospital was uh, an old, uh, venerated in some ways hospital in Harlem. It was one of the first hospitals in the city to uh, employ African-American doctors. It was an integral part of the community. At the same time, I think everybody had agreed from a medical delivery, the delivery of medical services, it had deteriorated. Uh, in the course of uh, cutting uh, the budget, he decided to close the hospital, one of 16 or 17 municipal hospitals. Um, this was a $9 million savings, which even then was, was not meaningful. He completely uh, miscalculated the importance of that hospital to the community. Um, and the more he became aware of it, the louder the community, which is principally African-American leaders, um, protested, the, the, the more he dug in his heels, which was his instinct and which was, I think, highly counterproductive then. So it led to very ugly battles um, with the African-American community. As an aside, he had promised to keep it open as part of his um, a deal or an agreement he made with Harlem leaders in order to um, get their support in the 77 race. So putting this all together, it seemed like a cynical move on his part. And then I think when the community protested, I think he was tone deaf. And I think he also, frankly, racialized the conflict and made things worse. And I, we deal with the race issue through the movie because, as you know, you know, when he lost, it was uh, to an African-American candidate, not a coincidence. At a time when the city was in turmoil. At a time the city was really split racially, and I think... Uh, uh, this is probably the, uh, but easily the worst aspect of his legacy. I, I don't think there's any way to whitewash, if you will, um, that. I think he did not bring the city together racially at a time when we desperately needed it. Right, so it's almost like starting with Sydenham, that issue seemed to plague him throughout his uh, mayoralty. Uh, Diane, do you think that was um, mostly his fault? Do you think that there were times when he was unfairly maligned? Was it a mixture of both? What, what was going on with, with this guy whose instincts generally, politically at least, uh, seemed to be so sound? Well, that's true, what you say. I do think he regretted it. He said so when Neil filmed him and, uh, on this subject, that he made a mistake and he should never have done it. His instincts first was always, whatever we're doing here, we're doing it on the merits. So on the merits, Sydenham should have been closed. I have to c correct Neil, though. I don't think he ever made a deal, as you put it, because he didn't make deals. He might have, he might have suggested <clears throat> to the leaders that he'd certainly think about it, the people, uh, uh, but I don't think we made a deal. Uh, I, I think there. My, my recollection <clears throat> is that they asked him as part of their interview in deciding who to endorse, what his plans for Sydenham were. And he said, I plan to keep it open. Well, but like, Whether know, that's a deal things, or not, I don't know. Okay, well, things change and Politics. life evolves and the numbers come out. And so they're not always what they 
seemed to be in the beginning. I, I do think, though, that uh, he was sorry, as he said, and he shouldn't have done it. I mean, not everything has to be done on the merits all the time. <laughs> there are the political angles. Ed always wanted to feel he was apolitical in that sense, but his antenna was great. So you're right that in this case, we maybe gave him the wrong advice. Do you have a sense of how he personally felt about African Americans? Well, look, I mean, he was down in Mississippi in the Civil Rights era. Back in, the, in 1964? Yes, during, yes, yes. Yeah. I mean, he... He, I mean, he was a great support. He was a he was a radical. I mean, he was he was a well, real actually, liberal when I met him. He actually changed. I mean, not just on uh, race issues. I mean, it, it was considered radical in those days. I didn't think it was radical, but I thought it was the right position. Uh, but it was considered radical in this country. Um, but he was very liberal on so many issues when he was in Congress and at the time, uh, apparently when he was running for mayor. But then that changed, evolved, or whatever, what happened? Well, what, what happened was, you go from Congress, which is conceptual, you pass a lot of legislation mandating cities to do things that cost a lot of money. And when you're in Congress, you don't know that. You don't really think about it. You're more of a statesman, you take that approach. So when he became mayor, and all of a sudden he was realizing what everything costs and how can we afford to do this, and look at what happened here and there, he had Rone Menchel, who was then a deputy mayor, prepare Rone. this speech or this paper called Millstone Mandate. And, he, and it was all about the federal programs that had been mandated by the Congress that cities had to then pay for because Congress would not appropriate the funds to pay for them, which is one of the reasons that he was always interested in having somebody like Al D'Amato, a Republican, <laughs> represent New York because he thought Al D'Amato could bring home the money to help pay for some of these mandates that had been foisted upon us uh, by the federal government. Now, um, Koch was on a roll for much, if not most, of his mayoralty, but then came that third term. Mm -hmm. And the, the, the third term, I mean, I think it's fair to say it was horrendous from uh, his perspective. Mm -hmm. Talk about that a little bit. Well, the third term began in January of 1986 with the um, suicide, first the attempted suicide, then the successful suicide of Donald Manis, who was the Queensboro president and a very, very close ally of Koch's. Powerful Democratic Powerful leader. Democratic, powerful leader. Right. It subsequently emerged that Donald Manis was under investigation for various forms of uh, malfeasance and bribery. And this is somebody who Koch had really um, uh, been extremely close to. In fact, Donald Manis was thought of as maybe the next mayor. From that scandal emerged a lot of other scandals, many of which involved Koch commissioners and other Koch allies who were on the take or corrupt in some fashion. There was never any implication or suggestion or a proof or I don't think anyone actually finally believed that Koch himself was corrupt. But because these were people he had made alliances, if not deals with, and had defended and had been very close to, and um, I, I think this totally, totally um, tainted his administration and tainted his judgment, if nothing else. He talks about in the film that he was depressed, he thought of suicide, he was fearful that people would think he was corrupt. Um, I think, and I think the film makes clear, that no one who knew him or no one who knows anything about Koch then or now thought he was personally corrupt. But uh, it definitely tainted him because he had, I think, exhibited very bad judgment with a lot of these characters, many of whom the Village Voice and, and probably you and the, the Daily News New York Times were writing about already, Stanley Friedman, Mead Esposito. These were controversial characters but, who Koch uh, embraced. Go ahead. First of all, to the I defense. have to say, yeah, no <laughs> deals, no deals. I said alliances. Uh, alliances, okay, but no deals. I mean, uh, Stanley Friedman was not elected by us, and we, were not, we did not appoint him. Mead Esposito, same thing. Donald Manis, same thing. Donald Manis ha happened to be one of the smartest people in that group of borough presidents. So I think that was probably one of the most significant shocks to Ed Koch that he'd ever had. I agree with Neil that um, I certainly did not think that Koch was personally corrupt. I don't know any reporters who covered Koch on any kind of a regular basis who did uh, think that. But did Ed ever say privately um, that he felt that he should have had a sense or ha have known what was going on? He never said that. He never did. I don't think he ever thought that. And I, what I think he really cared about a lot was whether people actually thought 
that he might be corrupt himself, which right. would have... So he was worried been. about that. He was very worried about that because, listen, I used to do his income taxes back <laughs> in the old days when, when they were very uncomplicated. And the, I used to go to an accountant who would say, well, you know, there are ways to save him money. I said, he doesn't want to save any money. He doesn't want any gimmicks. Just, we'll just pay the bill. We'll just pay the taxes. He was terrified of that. Now, one of the things that I always thought was intriguing about Ed Koch, you mentioned this enormous housing uh, redevelopment and reconstruction program mm -hmm. that he, that he yeah. set in motion. And a lot of people think that that's his um, greatest legacy. And yet, um, when he ran against uh, David Dinkins, tough, 89. brutal primary race in 1989, um, he never made a big deal out of the housing program, which was one of the, one of the strongest cards he could have played. Why do you think that was? Well, first of all, it wasn't quite the success yet because it hadn't been finished. But even so, there was ample evidence that the, that the city was doing something magnificent. The Times had, had, had covered it already. I think in general, uh, I, I don't know, you have to ask his campaign managers, who, uh, some of whom are still alive, and one of whom was actually the housing commissioner, come to think of it, <laughs> who should have known. But right. I think, you know, that race was so swept up in racial politics, if you recall. Right. And then in the summer, you had the death of Yousef Hawkins in Brooklyn, um, which totally dominated the uh, mayoral race. And I think he made some critical mistakes, and they were mistakes, again, of empathy, there were mistakes of how he expressed his feelings, and so the housing, you know, to say, yeah, but I just built 50,000 units of housing may or may not have mattered. I think also it was three terms. Three, three. terms is a term too much. He seemed to, uh, he seemed to think that himself. He said that people, people just get tired of you after a while. That's exactly he, right. Um, you were close to him for a very long time, mm -hmm. um, and right up until the end. Um, he obviously, um, loved and respected you and, and, and needed your counsel. Um, what, did, what did you admire so much about Ed Koch? Why were you there so long? Why did you care so much? First of all, we had a wonderful time together. I mean, we, we really, I enjoyed him immensely and I loved the challenge intellectually, which was uh, there every day. And it was an adventure to work for him. And the fact is that he always wanted to do the right thing. So you never, ever had to worry that anything you believed in or felt would be compromised in any way. You could speak the truth without recriminations. I mean, he'd get angry. <laughs> he wouldn't like it when you disagreed. But he provided a wonderful platform. I mean, when you think of all the great things we did, I mean, Neil referred earlier to the bond market when we re-entered the bond market. Look, we were able to start a capital program. The city hadn't had a capital program in years. So we could build parks. And Gordon Davis was a great parks commissioner. We built these fabulous parks. We improved parks. We started the first Central Park Conservancy. We built the biggest, the largest cultural program in the city of New York. We tripled the budget for culturals in New York City. The only budget that was larger was the federal government. And if you, if you include capital, we were larger than that. So there were just great things that we were able to accomplish. And it's hard to pull away from that. <laughs> you know, it really, it's, it's difficult. So, as he said, we were thrown out, and then we all had to find something else to do. But he's shown in those latter years, the well, years after government, too. Um, we're going to have to leave it there. I wish we had more time to talk about um, Ed Koch and his legacy. I'm fascinated with that era in New York. Thank you, um, thank you Bob. for being with us tonight, guys. Thanks. Thank you um, very much. I'd like to thank my guests, Neil Barsky and Diane Coffey. Neil's documentary, Koch, will stream online until October 22nd at pbs.org slash POV. And we'll be back in a moment with a final word. An awful lot of restaurant workers in New York, waiters, waitresses, and the like, make just $5 an hour, which is less than the minimum wage. Tips are supposed to bring them up to the minimum, but for many workers, that never happens. That wretchedly low pay is not nearly enough to cover the essential living expenses of food and shelter. 
The state of New York is raising the minimum wage for most workers. By the end of next year, it will be $9 an hour. But in a glaring injustice, the state did not see fit to offer any increase for these hardworking food service workers. Their minimum was left at $5 an hour, and that is just wrong. Governor Cuomo has now appointed a three-person board to look into the possibility of a wage increase for restaurant workers and other very low-paid service workers who rely on tips. This should not be a tough call. No one doing an honest job should have to rely on the kindness of strangers for their pay. Give these men and women the raise that they deserve. That's all for now. See you next time.